very happy to be moderating this panel. Um, this is really an all-star panel when it comes to the topic of money and politics um, from various different backgrounds, um, academically and professionally. Um, so I'm really excited to have, have everybody participate and looking forward to your great questions as well. So um, I wanna kind of open it up uh, to our panel with a few general questions um, that I'd like to get each of their thoughts on. And then I have some specific questions for some individual panelists. So I'll start with my first general question. So many people trace the source of unfettered corporate power to the role of money in politics. This includes funding candidates who share pro-corporate ideologies, using trade associations and 501c4 groups to hide political spending, uh, giving third party groups power to reshape and distort state and national politics, as well as using campaign contributions to buy access and lobby for pro-corporate pro policies. So how much do you think the source of unfettered corporate power is attributable to the role of money in politics as opposed to other social forces that people talked about earlier today? For example, the structural power of corporations, the decline of labor unions, et cetera. Um, so we'll start with Marianne. Um, thanks, Neil, for the question, and thanks to uh, the organizer for what is looking into to turn into a really fantastic conference. I've already learned um, a huge amount. Uh, Neil, your question is, you know, a very, you know, big one, and uh, I certainly don't believe that I have, you know, that I have the answer to that, you know, to that question. There's no doubt, though, that especially since, as was noted in the first panel, kind of Citizens United. Uh, there is kind of growing concern about, you know, kind of the use of, of money uh, in politics uh, and the growth of expenditure of independent expenditures uh, into, uh, into campaign. What I think has been, you know, kind of a, an important trend and the last election cycle has certainly made that clear is that more and more of the money that goes into influencing our election is hard, is hard to trace via the use of 501c4s, uh, social welfare organization or trade associations. Uh, it used to be at least kind of historically pre-Citizens United that we could see the mark of a given corporation, a given PAC uh, in terms of the spending that we have access to um, kind of lobbying reports that give us a sense of how much particular companies are spending to try to um, you know, kind of via uh, the lobbying process with uh, Citizens United in the growth of um, of dark money, this has become much, uh, much harder to trace. Now, to kind of complete, you know, being able to assess the relative importance of these forces, money and politics versus all the changes that have clearly changed the economy, you know, the, the decline in, in worker uh, organizations is one of the forces that you mentioned. That, that is, I think, a really much, much harder question to, uh, to answer. Excellent. Alex, what are your thoughts? Great, thanks for the for the terrific question, Neil, and thanks so much to the organizers and especially Professor Admani for for putting this together. It's a, a great discussion so far, and I'm just delighted to be here. So it's a good one because I think so much of the discussion around corporate political involvement focuses on the money that companies are spending or investing in all of these different ways in candidates or trade associations or in advertisements. But I think in order to understand why it feels like corporations in the United States have had such outside effects on political life in the United States, we have to step back and ask, what are the features of the US political and economic terrain that either magnify or reduce the ability of companies to intervene in politics in different ways? So for instance, that give companies a bigger bang for their buck should they make an investment in politics. And in addition, I think these institutional features of the US political economy, as it were, can also change the preferences that businesses have, what they want out of politics. And um, to sum up, I think there's good reason to believe that key pillars of the structure of the US economy and of government have both magnified the potential for businesses to reshape US politics and also change the preferences of businesses to narrow their, their political objectives away from the pursuit of upholding what we might call a mixed economy with investments in uh, education and social welfare and regulation in labor market standards and towards much more short-term goals um, of maximizing profit without, without any 
fetters of regulation or taxes. So what are some of these features that I'd point to? Well, I think the first one that's pretty distinctive in comparative perspective, thinking about that international context is federalism. It was brought up um, by Professor Winkler in the earlier panel that we have quite a strong system of federalism in the United States where the states have important authority over economic policy, social policy, and, and governance. Um, and there are other federal countries across the rich democracies to be sure, but unlike in those other countries, the US does far less to standardize taxes and regulations and create a floor across all, uh, all of the states. And that allows the states to compete with one another for capital, footloose capital. And even if it's the case that at the end of the day, businesses care about a whole lot more than taxes or regulation where they're deciding where to open up their businesses, uh, state lawmakers often are concerned about their reelection prospects enough to, uh, to accede to, to businesses' demands. As I can talk about more in detail later, you know, I think there's also a story about the weak legislative resources we give to state lawmakers that makes them susceptible to, to companies. Um, really quickly, the other institutional pillars I might elevate here are the courts. We, we heard about how the judiciary has been such an important venue for businesses to amplify their push for, for greater rights and privileges in the US political system. And again, that's a pretty unusual comparative feature of the US political system, the strength of our courts. Uh, the weakness of our regulatory state, which is of course in part a result of business efforts to uh, retrench the capacity and scope of enforcement. And lastly, the decline and weakness of our labor movement. In particular, not, all, not just the weakness of our labor movement when you look at density, but the fact that unlike in other countries, Unions are focused at the firm level, which gives them far less leverage, political and economic, over what companies are doing. So I'd point to those institutional pillars as, as providing uh, sort of a, a starting place for thinking about business power and preferences in the US. Excellent, thank you. And uh, next to Bruce, so Bruce is a former journalist and director of the Center for Public Accountability. So happy to hear kind of a, an outside academia perspective, if you will, on this question. Neil, thank you. And Anat, thank you very much for putting this together. It's, it's a pleasure to be with all of you and to be with you know, Alex, who I've seen on several occasions and been with. Uh, you know, I think that this is a, a, a very challenging question today because, you know, the issue of the, the sort of the demise of countervailing power, the decline of unions, uh, you know, all of these are very important. The, the size of corporations, the resources that they have, you know, we have found, and this is something I found not only at the center, but in my years on Capitol Hill as a, as a senior aide on both the Senate and in the House as a journalist covering Washington, corporate money is a major factor. You know, we've taken a look at that. Uh, you know, uh, Marianne talked about not knowing sort of the full extent of corporate money, but just what you can see, not only through PAC spending, but you go and you look at these contributions to the 527 committees. These are the committees that have been very active at the state level in reshaping and distorting state and national politics. And you find that that, that the, the resources that companies have, have poured into these committees, you know, you're looking at not just five figures, but six figures and seven figures. And the fact that, that they're giving to groups that target their spending, this give, it's amplified their power. And it really, and, and the results that we have seen over the last decade I would say in some respects are quite chilling because, you know, for instance, if you just take a look at, at the 527 committees at the state level, you know, the Center for Political Accountability did a report uh, that came out in July called Conflicted Consequences, where we, we tracked the money that went into the 527s, the, both the, Demo the governor's associations, the state legislative campaign committees and attorneys general associations. And we paid attention to three in particular, the three Republican ones, because those were the ones that really had the major impact. And you saw you know, the flipping of state legislatures, gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering that resulted from that. You know, you've taken a look at the, the attack on the Affordable Care Act. Well, you know, that was facilitated by by very significant contributions that companies made to the Republican Attorneys General Association. And then you find $650,000 going to Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas, who was the lead plaintiff in the suit to, to try to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. You know, you also have the whole area of climate change where you've had state attorneys general, you know, filing suit against, uh, for instance, the EPA Clean Power Initiative and other environmental and climate change initiatives. And you know, companies will be giving to the 527s. They may not be paying attention to the end consequences, but the fact is they are underwriting consequences that really have been very destructive and in many instances conflict with company policies and positions. Uh, 
you know, one of the things that we find in looking at the 527s is we wanted to know where was the money coming from? You know, you know, the question is how much money is coming from the corporate sector? Well, when we looked at the 527s over the last decade, that would have been from the 2010 election cycle up through the first half of, uh, of the 2020 cycle, we found that, uh, that close to half of the 1.5 billion that the six groups raised came from public companies and their trade associations. Then when you take a look at the 2020 cycle alone, and you look at public companies and their trade associations, we found that, that you know, they contributed 51% of the more than $150 million raised by the three Republican uh, 527s. Again, the RGA, the RSLC, and, the, and, and RAGA. You know, and you know, again, you know, what is important is looking at the consequences. You know, in this case, money does talk. Money does have impact. You know, when you take a look at the amount of money coming in from the labor, you, from labor, organized labor comes in with a pittance compared to, uh, you know, to what the, what is coming in from the corporate sector. And you know, in, in this case, you know, it's not a matter of singling out these groups. It's a matter of just following the money. You know, in the report that we did, Collision Course, that was our report in 2018 where we took a, took a look at the heightened risks that companies face from, uh, from conflicted spending. And then when we, took a, when we did conflicted consequences, we made it clear at the beginning of these reports that these reports follow the money. That's why you could talk about the Republican groups because that's where the, where the action was, that those were the groups that really shaped what is happening. So I think, you know, when you ask the question, you know, the role of, um, of money in, in the unfettered power, money plays a very significant role. Uh, you have the other institutional changes that Alex and Marianne talked about, but money is a major factor. Excellent, thank you. Um, I also want to get this panel's thoughts on a bit of the morning discussion from sort of a, a non-legal perspective, but also, you know, from the kind of the arenas of quantitative social science and other areas. So, you know, a lot of this debate in the United States centers around a few unique ethical questions. For example, how important is free speech in a society and how do we define it? Uh, particularly since free speech is uniquely very important in the United States, um, not only legally, but ethically, kind of what our moral sense of a country is. And moreover, um, the question that was discussed of what are we think the rights and responsibilities of corporations are and how are they distinct from individual people? So how much do you think that these two issues, free speech and interpretations of corporate personhood, affect the balance of power between corporations and other stakeholders in society? And you know, another aspect to this, and this was um, a chat question earlier, which I thought was very interesting, is this kind of new uh, trend of companies branding themselves as socially and environmentally conscious, but not following through on those kind of virtue signaling. And um, it, it kind of a, it was nicely put in the chat is, is it better to have these Milton Friedman corporations under Citizens United or these CSR or faux CSR corporations under Citizens United? Um, so I know there's a lot of general questions, but Marianne, we'll start with you to see. I can go so on, on the first on the first half. And, and again, I really appreciate the first panel and I, and I learned a lot through it. I mean, I think you know, confirm my understanding that the reason why we have, you know, lobbying this country, the reason why we have PAC spending, the reason why we had the 2010 decisions to allow any organization, corporations, unions to spend as much as they as they want in independent expenditures is really because of the First Amendment. And I think it was really, you know, I think uh, valuable to hear back that that seems to be what really makes, you know, kind of the United States special compared to uh, to other uh, other countries. It's just you know the importance of the First Amendment and and uh, and free speech. So I think certainly that has enabled uh, you know the the expansion of uh, of corporate money into uh, into politics. And I think it raises question for what's coming next because right now we still have constraint on how much corporation can spend directly into elections. Um, I, I see the next kind of logical step with the Supreme Court that keep on thinking the same way that those limits. Could also be very much, uh, very much lifted given, uh, given OER, and and that's you know that is certainly uh, concerning. Uh, with respect to your your other question, you know, do we want to have CSR type companies in the Citizens United world versus Milton Friedman type companies in a, in the Citizens United world? It, you know, it very much depends, you know, what kind of CSR type companies we have. If it is really true CSR and you know corporations that really think that. 
they have responsibilities beyond their shareholders, where we really truly have responsibilities to you know their workers, to the environment, to their communities. You know, I certainly would prefer those kind of corporations that you know short-term oriented, profit maximizing, built Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman-like corporations uh, to spend uh, indiscriminately uh, and uh, on, on on politics. The real question is whether the CSR that exists right now is truly a reflection of companies trying to uh, trying to do well, trying to do good for society beyond maximizing profit, or whether the CSR is more some form of greenwashing or other ways for the corporations to try to achieve uh, mainly the objective they have in mind for their shareholders rather than the stakeholders at large. Thank you, Alex. Great, thanks so much. It's a terrific question. And it's uh, one particularly in thinking about companies, corporate social responsibility obligations and practices uh, and realities that I've learned, of course, from your work and, and thinking about it as a way for, as Marianne mentioned, potentially companies to evade regulation by projecting themselves as paragons of, uh, of corporate citizens. But you know, to step back and to answer both of your questions, perhaps simultaneously, I would say it's hard to think about um, the obligations and responsibilities of companies and the rights that they should be afforded in the abstract without thinking about the power, rights, and responsibilities of other stakeholders. And for me, when I look across the broad sweep of history in the United States and across other rich democracies, it seems like the labor movement and workers in particular are just such a crucial stakeholder for changing the preferences of firms, the behaviors of firm inside their walls, as well as thinking about their political advocacy more generally. And there, I think the legal doctrine of free speech has been used effectively weaponized by many corporate activists, along with ideological activists, to simultaneously buttress the opportunities that, that companies have for expressing political views, engaging in politics, and simultaneously dampen the power of organized labor. I think far too often folks um, assume that there is a symmetry between the effects of Citizen United on labor unions and companies, and to be sure that ruling applied to both. But when you look at the broader body of jurisprudence that the Supreme Court has produced on labor unions, political involvements, on their organizational abilities, the First Amendment has been used as a tool for weakening them, most notably through the Janus versus AFSCME Supreme Court decision that effectively applied a right to work law to all public sector employees, making it significantly harder for public sector labor unions, now pretty, pretty much one of the pillars of the American labor movement, given the weakness in the private sector, weakening the ability of those public sector unions to attract and retain members, to build revenue, and then ultimately to engage in politics. And so when I think about the legal system and the way it's changed these rights and responsibilities of actors, I think that it's been uh, a very one-sided battle and one that if we're thinking about um, rebalancing the terrain, we need to think seriously about um, you know, how to how to empower in a real way those other stakeholders and especially labor. Thank you so much. Bruce. You know, again, this is a very good question because I think that free speech does pose a serious problem in placing checks on political spending. You know, it's been used by companies to free themselves from the limits on political contributions and spending. And what we saw in the case of Citizens United is that it did accelerate the rise of dark money through trade associations and 501c4s. So you had money that can't be traced, but you're having tremendous amounts of money coming in that, that, that I think are distorting and corrupting. Now, you know, again, you know, through voluntary disclosure, since at this point, getting anything through Congress is, neck, is, is impossible. Uh, you know, this, the center has been using uh, voluntary disclosure to place a shining light on, to shine a light on companies running money through trade associations and C4s. Uh, and also, you know, by highlighting the amount of money that companies are, are, are contributing through the 527s. You know, you know now when, when you take a look at the voluntary disclosure of companies, and we have this posted on our website under Track Your Company, that's our our database, you can get a sense of the amount of money going through into trade associations for the non-deductible portion of the payments. That's for lobbying and election related spending. You can also now begin to get a sense of company memberships in trade associations like, like the US Chamber of Commerce, which does not disclose its, um, you know, its membership. You know, we're finding that uh, you know, through our annual index, the CPA Zicklin Index, which benchmarks the S&P 500 companies on their political disclosure and accountability policies, that there has been a steadily increasing number of companies who are either disclosing the trade association payments and C4 payments or prohibiting them. 
which means they're walling off money in that area. Now, a great deal of progress has been made, but I'm going to say a great deal of progress remains to be made on that. We're sort of in a middle passage uh, period on that. You know, I think that, you know, companies have created a situation today, you know, where they're viewed as having the same responsibilities as enjoyed by individuals. You know, when Marianne talks about, you know, the, the whole problem of greenwashing, the companies, you know, stating that they're environmentally conscious, they're socially conscious, they're making statements on, on racial justice, uh, they talk about climate change, you know, and, and one of the problems that we have found that they make great on the rhetoric. But again, when you take a look at their political spending, it just undercuts, it undercuts the rhetoric. Uh, you know, in the run up to the election, I was getting calls from, uh, from Bloomberg Green, from e, e News, from the Wall Street Journal, from a, a slew of publications asking about this. You know, this was not a case of our generating coverage on it. It was the media is now becoming much more uh, sort of attentive to this. And I think that's important because it's putting companies on the spot. And also what it's doing is just highlighting the whole issue of hypocrisy. And hypocrisy becomes a matter of risk. I mean, I think when you take a look at this, you really have to take a look at this as a risk management issue, a corporate governance issue. Uh, because companies today face not only reputational risks on this, but they face business risks because people are making purchasing decisions based on that. You know, we had a, an instance where uh, a, we were engaging a company to adopt political disclosure and the corporate secretary said to us unprompted, you know, he was concerned that a controversial contribution could lead consumers to shift to a competing product. So I think that companies are, you know, are recognizing that they face a problem there. And again, getting back to free speech, you know, they have to recognize that free speech can be a double-edged sword for them on this. Uh, so anyway, uh, and by the way, one other thing, uh, there's, there's also the other side, there's another scandal that really needs to have much greater attention paid to. That's in Ohio in, involving First Energy, the big uh, public utility that made a $60 million contribution to a 501c4. Now that led to the indictment of the Speaker of the Ohio House. He is out in the company. It has led to the firings of several top executives, including the CEO. It's also led to a decline in the company's stock price. So this is another example of what the repercussions of, uh, of political spending are. Excellent, yeah. I mean, I think the point on reputational risk is well taken, not only among consumers, but also among employees. Um, yes, and I know, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So You're I don't know if you want to talk a little bit right. about that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we, and we can get into it. I mean, it, companies really face this risk on a three-dimensional level. Excellent. So I want to now move on to some specific questions for the panelists based on their background and expertise. So Marianne, we'll start with you. Um, in 2003, there was a very famous paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives by Stephen and Selbeher and his colleagues. It had a very provocative title, which is, Why is there so little money in US politics? And this paper has been cited over 1,400 times. And from my perspective, this is one of the most important papers in quantitative social science that people react to. And it really frames a lot of the discussion in money in politics, particularly since it's so hard to get causal inferences on the effect of money on political decision making. And there's just a lot of interesting stylized facts that people always bring up, like the US spends more money on Halloween candy than politics and, and, and money in politics, things like that. And I'm wondering, coming from your perspective, do you think the framework for thinking about money in politics has changed over the last 17 years since that article was published? Uh, for example, your own research has uncovered very novel creative ways that money can influence political behavior, such as the use of charitable contributions as tax exempt form of lobbying. And you, know, you and Ray Fistman and colleagues have, have found just really ingenious ways corporations through forensic econ econometric techniques, you know, find ways that maybe you're not picked up in traditional analyses. Um, so yeah, I just wanna kind of get your general reactions to this question. Why is there such little money in US politics? And is that the right way to think about the question? Yeah, so no doubt this was, I think, an influential paper. And, and just to, you know, kind of for people that may, may not remember this paper or may not have read it, I think there's a few important things, you know, to keep in mind. There's a few important stylized facts that I think remain true even as of today, right? So I think this paper, paper was very much focused on, 
unpack unpacks uh, and made the point that you know, the amount of money going from corporation to directly into political campaign was much smaller than the amount coming from individuals. Made the point that lots of corporations don't have uh, don't have PACs, and uh, for the ones that have PACs, would not you know can would not spend to the level that um, were were the limits uh, on spending. So I, th I think a few things are important to you know to keep in mind. The focus was solely on that. Um, it is uh, it is. And, and in the federal system, so not you know in state you know state state level election, election. I think Bruce's work has shown that a lot is happening at the state level that was never part of this paper. So that's one point I will make. Um, the other thing that is true is that they were only looking at at PACs, they not looking at lobbying. We know that expenditures just even on federal lobbying are a couple of dollars of magnitude bigger the amount that corporations spend uh, spend on PACs. And uh, I think one way to you know to read the result of this paper. Is that you know kind of the the PAC spending seems to be more I think they use the expression of bringing wine to you know the dinner party the idea that the PAC spending is a way to to get access you know kind of you give money to politicians so that whenever you need them uh, because you have a message to share about a new piece of legislation that you like or do not like that door that door will be open and and I think there's been subsequent research that that suggests that that is one way to think about the PAC spending it's just about you know it, it's really about about access. So, you know, companies that spend money on um, in campaigns, give money to politicians, also are the kind of corporation that do a lot of a lot of lobbying. So these two things really go uh, really go hand in hand. In terms of what has changed, I mean, obviously, you know, we have had an explosion of, of independent expenditures into campaign. Uh, it remains, you know, that, that's certainly new compared to that piece back in the early 2000s. It remains, for the reason I stated before, kind of a little unclear as to how much of these independent expenditures are coming directly from corporations, because those are, you know, harder to trace uh, because the disclosure is just not, uh, it's just not as good. Now, with regard to, uh, you know, the broader question, why there's so little money in politics, the point that we try to make in our work is that, you know, the kind of obvious channels that have been studied by political scientists, obvious channels of influence, may only be the tip of the iceberg. Right. So besides, you know, kind of giving money to politicians, besides lobbying, there are other ways via which, you know, corporations can influence the lawmaking or rulemaking process. One channel that we don't study and I think is understudied is via kind of labor market type mechanisms. Right. So the, the French talk about la pantoufle. I think there's similar systems in Japan, like descent from heaven. You know, the idea, especially given the discrepancies between the compensation that you can get in the public sector versus the private sector, that you can get you know, public servants to do the thing that you want if there's a promise of a job in the private sector once uh, when they leave their, their public sector position. I think that's another mechanism by which corporations can have influence that is not being you know, tracked as closely as um, kind of uh, political giving into campaign. What we do in our work is look at yet another mechanism which is via uh, kind of CSR. So it's a strategic form of, of corporate social responsibility. Um, and we, we, we highlight two ways that corporations seem to be using CSR strategically for political purposes. One is in the lawmaking area and the other one is in the rulemaking area. I'll, I'll just talk about the work that we have done uh, in lawmaking. And I think one way to you know, kind of, you know, kind of frame um, the results that we have in the paper is that if you look at the geography of PAC spending by corporations, so which particular congressional districts are receiving money which, uh, from a particular corporation, and you look at the correlation between the patterns of PAC spending and the CSR giving by these corporations, they track each other. So a particular corporation would give PAC money to a particular congressional district and would also give CSR money to that particular congressional district. And this is something that we can study by looking at the corporate foundations that are associated with corporations and the geography of the particular nonprofits, where they are located, that the, um, that the giving uh, is going to. So we then kind of push this further and indeed document the fact that more CSR money is going to congressional districts that are particularly relevant to a corporation. So to take an example, you know, if I'm Boeing, there are a subset of members of Congress that particularly matter to me because they are going to be uh, individuals that will decide on important decisions that have to do with defense and defense spending. And as congressional committees change and the composition of these congressional committees change, we can see the CSR giving of Boeing to keep on with the example evolving in a way that's consistent 
with trying to give more CSR to those congressional districts that are those of the member of the House that are going to be sitting on the Defense Committee, right? I think what's particularly, I think, interesting here is that unlike uh, kind of backspending or, uh, or lobbying, um, the reputation mechanism kind of breaks down, right? So, you know, we think that one of the forces that's constraining companies, you know, kind of spending on, on, on elections might be the fear of these negative kind of reputa reputational effects. When it comes to CSR, that link kind of breaks down. So there's something that's potentially quite dangerous here is that the reputational forces is just not as play um, as much. And I'll stop here. Excellent, thank you. So I think that sets up my question for Alex really nicely. Um, so I also want to get your reaction to this framing in the quantitative social science literature, why is there so little money in US politics? And like Marianne, your research has looked at very kind of ingenious ways that corporations influence policymaking. So for example, you have a book on legislative subsidi subsidization of writing legislation through organizations like ALEC. A uh, recent book of yours looks at mobilizing workers um, via social networks. And more generally, you're kind of one of the leaders in the space of American political economy, this burgeoning literature, and pointing to structural features of political institutions that have provided advantages for capital above and beyond specific investments made by individual firms. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about those and other um, effects of corporate behavior and strategy on policy outputs. Sure, happy to do so. And the piece that you reference is just such a great piece to engage with. It's the sort of uh, work in, in, I think, political science that really forces you to think through some of your assumptions and the general frameworks that we're operating in. And I've certainly wrestled with it in a lot of the work that I've tried to, uh, to do on this subject. So let me just start by um, reiterating some of the points that Marianne mentioned in contextualizing um, the, uh, the Tulloch paradox or why is there so, so little money in, in US politics? I think, like Marianne, I agree that there are just so many more venues for investing in politics than the ones that were covered initially in that piece um, that deserve attention. And I would just, you know, reiterate the importance, for instance, of the judiciary. I was just looking back at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's litigation record, for instance, and in recent years, it accounts for something like a quarter of all of the amicus briefs that are filed at the Supreme Court. And it's got one of the best win records um, when you look at the cases in which the Chamber of Commerce has expressed a clear position. Going back to the start of the Roberts course, it's something like 70% of the time the chamber is on a winning side of an issue. And so, you know, that's just an incredibly important way that business can set the rules of the game in areas like regulation, consumer rights, environmental regulation, and, and, uh, and labor policy outside of electoral or judicial politics. Um, the other thing to note about the general institutions of American politics um, is, 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 that I think is relevant for this point and in interpreting that the piece that you mentioned is we have a very status quo biased system compared to other countries, particularly parliamentary countries, um, it is very hard to move major pieces of legislation and increasingly so as we enter in a world of close and divided control of Congress. And we're seeing that now with the incoming Biden-Harris administration likely to have a divided Congress that makes gonna make it very hard for it to do any sort of uh, uh, activity. And from the perspective of a business or a firm or a trade association that's seeking to keep the field clear of major costs in the form of regulations or, um, uh, or taxes, you know, that's generally a good thing. And so to the extent that these firms' preferences are already baked into the status quo and all they have to do is fend off regulation or new legislation, you know, that's an institutional advantage that they have that will, it may explain why um, you don't see as much spending necessarily as, as you might expect in some of these areas. Um, the last thing I'll say is sort of where you left off in talking about some of my specific research on business strategies for shaping public policy and policy outputs that extend well beyond elections. And I'll, I'll point to two that I think are, are relevant to this discussion. So one is the ways that businesses can provide subsidies and supports for lawmakers, particularly those that might otherwise lack those resources. And I've spent a lot of time looking at corporate lobbying at the state level where um, you know, many lawmakers simply don't have staff. You know, They're lucky if they have one or two part-time 
and staffers they share with other lawmakers uh, when the legislature is in session. By the way, legislatures are only in session for only a few months every year, meaning that the pace is quite frantic and harried and everyone is racing to write bills, introduce them and move them through the process. In some states, legislatures don't actually meet every year, in fact. And layered on top of all of that is the fact that state lawmakers are often paid quite little and so they have to have other jobs that may take their attention away from the business of policy making. So under those conditions, as I've shown, outside organizations that are backed by companies can have a great deal of success in supporting lawmakers by providing them model bill ideas, um, even the draft text of the legislation, as well as research support, um, you know, people that they can call if they have questions about the legislation, a uh, roster of experts who are all lined up and ready to testify on behalf of that bill when it gets introduced in the legislature, the talking points and polling that they might need. All of that are things that, um, you know, they certainly cost money, but when you think about the comparative effectiveness of an investment in that area, it gives you a much better, bigger bang for your buck than say trying to invest in a very high profile race for say Congress or, or the presidency potentially, especially when you're thinking about state legislatures. So that's sort of one example of where business can really maximize the, the influence they have. And the other one that I point to that touches on, you know, Bruce's comment about the stakeholders within firms uh, as, as firms are engaged in political activities are, you know, increasing employer mobilization of workers. Um, increasingly, as I've shown in my research, businesses may try and reach out to their workers when there is a bill pending in Congress, and they'll encourage their workers to contact that member of Congress and say, you know, this bill is important to me. Um, it's important to employment at this firm. And, and if this bill doesn't pass, you know, well, we're going to keep that in mind when we vote in the next election. And that can be quite persuasive to members of Congress who are receiving, you know, hundreds, um, if not thousands of, of these letters threatening uh, uh, electoral retaliation. Um, so, you know, that's yet another tool that businesses can use. Um, that wouldn't get picked up on in the sort of aggregate tax spending totals that sometimes get analyzed in this area. Excellent. Fabulous. Okay, so Bruce, I have one question for you, and then I'll have a, a wrap-up question for the panel uh, before we get into the audience Q&A. So your organization, uh, the Center for Political Accountability, has focused on, I think, two uh, core values, which are transparency and accountability as mechanisms for dealing with this issue of money in politics. And indeed, I, I, you know, in the Supreme Court, after the United, Citizens United decision actually recommended to Congress that they should pass this disclosure legislation. And there was a little bit of movement on that after that decision, but it never actually happened. So do you actually think that these um, concepts like transparency, accountability, disclosure would address these problems? Or in reality, is that just too much information for the media to communicate and the, the public to actually process? It's a good question. And let me say that, you know, based on my experience, both as a journalist and, you know, leading the Center for Political Accountability, disclosure has been very effective. And the amount of information that comes out has not been difficult for the media to process. I mean, the problem is sometimes getting the attention of the media so they understand that. But, you know, increasingly, you know, we have been, uh, we have been both generating stories and having reporters come to us, you know, when they now begin to make the connections between company spending and consequences. You know, disclosure is critical for dealing with the problem of corporate money in politics because you need to know how much money is there and where the money is going and what the consequences are. And this is critical for the public, for shareholders, the media, corporate directors and, and corporate directors, you know, they need to know what their companies are spending and they need, and you know, when you're talking about company spending, it's not just the PAC spending, it's the spending with corporate funds. I mean, I must say when I've looked at some of the political science work, the political scientists spend all of the time dealing with the PAC spending, but they have to, they, and they ignore, they ignore the corporate side. And the corporate side, as I said before, is where the big money is. Now, you know, it's also important that corporate boards need to know because corporate boards have that responsibility as a fiduciary responsibility to manage risk, you know, to, to set the policies that govern you know, what the companies are doing politically, what they're doing with their money, you know, and, and ensuring, you know, that, that, that the company is not put at risk. And when you take a look at risk today, it's risk that becomes much broader. You have to take a look at risk three-dimensionally. Um, you know, because again, as I said, you know, the money that we have seen today has really reshaped and distorted our politics and policy. We have the problems that we face today 
in part, and I think to, to a great degree, because of this spending over the past decade and even longer than that. Now, you know, disclosure legislation is needed, but in the absence of disclosure legislation, uh, you know, the center has made really, I think, significant progress in making corporate political disclosure and accountability the norm. I mean, this is, this is something that really amazed me that, and I must say at one point, I finally had to pinch myself about that. You know, Rob Jackson is a very good friend of mine and uh, I've known Rob for over a decade. And about five years ago, I remember he, was, he came into the center's office and he said, you know, you've made political disclosure and accountability the norm through private ordering. Well, as a non-lawyer, that term didn't mean anything to me. But then Rob Yablon, a professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School, wrote an article 2017 in the Iowa Law Review, Campaign Finance Reform Without Law. And the central point of Rob Yablon's piece was that through private ordering, through reaching that critical mass that companies, through, through, by, by companies acting on their own, creating private law, they made it the norm. And you know, we have found now that companies that have not adopted political disclosure and accountability policies are viewed as outliers. And, you know, and we can see that also with the CPA Zicklin Index. You know, the fact that companies have accepted it, that companies use the 24 indicators as the template for the policies that they're adopting. And also that companies want to score well. They want to not only increase their scores, but there is a race to become a trendsetter company, which means a score of 90 or above. You know, and I think that, you know, you know when, when you look at transparency, you, as you said, you have to pair transparency and accountability because the two go hand in hand. You know, they're an essential part of enterprise risk management. They're an essential part of governance. Disclosure in and of itself isn't gonna change behavior, but behavior is changed when you have both disclosure and accountability. And accountability means strong policies governing the company's political spending and robust board oversight. Those are really essential for changing how much companies spend, where they spend, taking a look at the consequences and taking that into account. And also, you know, for, you know with, with Marianne talking about corporate social responsibility, looking at the broader impact of that spending, because companies are members of society, companies are you know, members of the broader community. You know, what happens on education spending? What happens on research? What happens on infrastructure spending? What happens in terms of the pay they give to employees? So employees have the money for a consumer driven economy. All of these things really need to be taken into account to create the type of environment that really companies need to grow and thrive. Um, you know, we have been successful in making corporate and conflicted political spending an issue. You know, again, you know, what, you know, what really impressed me is after the conflicting consequences came out, the findings were picked up by the New York Times. They were picked up by the Financial Times, the Guardian. You know, they're looking at the impact on gerrymandering. STAT, which is a Boston Globe publication covering the pharmaceutical industry, it did a very detailed piece on the pharmaceutical companies that really helped underwrite the attack on the Affordable Care Act through their contributions to attorneys general who then brought suit against the ACA. You know, you know, and again, companies have told us they're concerned about controversial spending. Now, I'll just have one final thing to say. The center released an updated model code of conduct for political spending last October. This updated a code we came out with in 2007. The new one is, is the CPA Wharton Zicklin model code. And that creates a framework to guide how companies set their policies, how they evaluate their spending, you know, the ethical, the social, the societal obligations and, uh, and responsibilities that they face. And that, you know, these should go into sort of the policies that they adopt. And that's very important for bringing about the type of change that we're talking about in, in how companies approach their spending or whether they should spend. Excellent. So I think um, Bruce's point specifically about private ordering and self-regulation will lead me to my final kind of wrap-up question that I think everyone can have a, a little bit of time on because I want to get to the audience questions too. So I want to just get all the three panelists to say, if you had to have one simple solution that can move the needle on this, that's actually realistic per points about, you know, gridlock in Washington, you know, what would it be? So, you know, I would just say to Alex's point, I think professionalizing state legislatures is probably not a realistic solution, at least in the short term. Um, you know, 
making the Wyoming legislature go from meeting once every two years to meeting every day with $100,000 salaries is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and additionally, uh, the background, at least in the US, is that we have very complicated cleavages right now, where the Republican Party is actually becoming the party of the working class. So you actually kind of have an interesting coalition of working class and capital class against the professional class. Um, so given kind of this background, what would you say are actually some tangible short-term solutions uh, to some of these issues? So we'll start with Marianne. I don't, I don't think I have a good answer, you know, answer to this. I mean, I'll reiterate the point that Bruce made and, you know, kind of, and I don't know, I don't know really what's realistic, you know, in the current kind of political environment in the US, but any step that can be made towards trying to increase disclosure would certainly be a step in the right direction. The feasibility of that, uh, I'm, I'm not so clear. The, the broader, you know, I think the broader thing that, that I would like to say, and it goes back to, I think, the back end of, of the first panel conversation is that a rethinking of, of corporate law and corporate governance in this country, where there will be a real attempt to bring workers, you know, inside of the boardroom, kind of worker representative, and, and would be like really legal mechanism to give voice to the groups um, that are currently kind of really underrepresented because they don't have the financial means to make their voices heard. Um, as much, I think, you know, seems to me like a crucial step uh, to move forward and, uh, and maintain, uh, maintain our democracy and ma maintain an, an economy that's going to work well for, uh, for, for a broader group of individuals. One more thing I would like to say, and I know this is about corporations and democracy, but, you know, we, we would not solve all the problems by restricting corporations, uh, you know, rights to, to spend into a campaign. I think at the core, we have a huge amount of income inequality in this country, and a lot of the money that's influencing our elections is not coming from corporate treasuries. It's coming from, you know, very, very wealthy individuals that, you know, for whatever reason, whether it is their taste or, you know, because they think they can really get something out of it as spending a huge amount of money. So, I know the focus is on corporations, but I think this is only one part, you know, kind of one part of the problem. Income inequality is feeding into political inequality, and that also needs to be addressed if we want to save um, this democracy. Excellent. Alex. Ooh, that's a, a tough act to follow and an inspiring note that Marianne ended on. But, you know, I, I think I would agree that the best tack forward is to focus on constructing countervailing power to corporate interests, to other concentrated interests that are leading to unequal political representation in the United States. And I guess I would have three buckets of things I might focus on since you took it, you've taken the professionalization of legislatures away as an option. Um, so the first one is, as Marianne mentioned, I think reviving the labor movement, not just to return to the 1950s when we were at, you know, a quarter or a third of the private sector workforce covered, but really thinking about fundamentally changing the structure of labor representation in the United States so that it's not focused on individual firms and establishments, which I think sub substantially dampens the ability of workers to have a say over how companies are structured in an increasingly um, international economy, uh, moving towards a model of more sectoral bargaining and input um, into how companies are, are governed. Um, obviously, that's a longer term. Uh, longer term change that's going to require a bunch of steps, but I would put that on the table. The other thing is to think about other constituencies, consumers, um, for instance, um, the environment, thinking about ways of bolstering countervailing power in those movements and something very specific that state governments and the federal government could do is create offices of political participation that would either directly or indirectly support um, you know, interveners who would participate in the rulemaking process, who would help oversee um, uh, decision making in a way that would check the expertise and the money that companies can bring to these processes that so often don't receive sufficient attention. And then in the last bucket of things, um, I'd put, you know, significant electoral and political reform that would increase the voice of everyone. So that's voting reform, you know, the package of things that House Democrats recently passed in HR1, um, automatic voter registration, um, same day registration, ensuring a federal right to vote, all of those things would increase the ability of the public as a whole to check the power of concentrated economic interests. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, I'll give you the last word on this before we move on to the audience q and I'm going to start off with, with a book to recommend. You know, Jacob Hacker and, uh, and Paul Pearson's book, Let Them Eat Tweets. It is a very important book to read because what it does is it really lays out you know, the forces that we've had that have reconfigured and really, I think, put American democracy in great uh, jeopardy. But, you know, you asked one thing that's needed. 
and I'm going to come in with a rifle shot. The Securities and Exchange Commission adopting a rule requiring companies to disclose their political spending with corporate funds. That would be absolutely essential because it would make disclosure uniform and universal. It would level the playing field and would get out there. You know, what money is coming in from the corporate sector? Now, I agree with Marianne, you know, that the individuals are very significant. When you take a look at the presidential level, you do, you get a great deal of money coming in from the from the mega wealthy, uh, you know, contributing to the various super PACs and even through the C4s. But when you're taking a look at Congress and you're taking a look at the state level, and even when you're taking a look at judicial races, that has come up, you know, there's a significant amount of money. I would say maybe a dominant source, a dominant source is the corporate money. And that that has to be addressed. And it, you have to you have to know what is there. And then, you know, from that, you know, with the work that we're doing, you, you add on the layer of accountability. Excellent. Um, so for the next 20 minutes, um, I'll, I've curated some audience questions. Um, and so I'll just kind of read the question and then any of you three who have a reaction to it, that'd be great. And if you don't have a reaction, that's okay too. Um, so the first one is from Jerry Davis at Michigan. So he's asking, um, we often think of U.S. law and state corporate laws analogous to a bespoke tailor. Businesses aim to get the laws they want via political spending. But many corporations are more like shoppers at a mall, buying off-the-rack regulatory frameworks from vendors around the world. So, for example, many pharmaceutical companies are incorporated in Ireland. Royal Caribbean is incorporated in Liberia. And the flag it flies under is Panama. Uh, tech firms have IP subsidiaries in Bermuda. So how should this influence our thinking on today's discussion? I, I guess I can start, given that <laughs> I brought up the question of federalism before. I make no pretense of having a deep knowledge of state corporate law, but I will say that what makes our, our system of federalism so distinct from other countries that are our federal states is the lack of strong federal standards on so many of these issues. I, it sounds like corporate law is, is certainly one of them, but I would add you know, tax and regulatory policy as well. Um, similarly, I think the lack of a more robust fiscal equalization mechanism across states, the fact that the federal government doesn't do as much as other countries to explicitly redistribute from, um, from states that have less fiscal capacity uh, to, to those that have less fiscal capacity to the, from those that have more, uh, creates leverage for wealthy individuals and companies to, to venue shop and to threaten to flee um, states if they don't like the particular tax and regulatory cho choices that are being made. So I think um, for all those reasons, you, you might favor a stronger federal standards to reduce corporate political and economic power in that area. The next question uh, is, one of the problems we see in social media is the paying for not only political ads, often by super PACs funded by corporates, but also ideological ads that sway society and voter opinion and that funding by corporates into these digital ads masked as native ads that are hard to figure out who funds it. They can squash natural individual momentum. How do we look at the First Amendment around this freedom to buy up the whole information ecosystem without the general public understanding these influential forces that read as news or CSR ideas or groups are not really all that self-organized? So I would also add like the flip side to this question, which is you know, a big difference from the time Milton Friedman was writing was that we have social media now, which actually some could argue democratizes the information ecosystem. Um, and also, you know, the original ideas of pluralism is that things like social media um, would allow like a new Ralph Nader to come up to um, kind of advocate for consumer rights or labor rights. So uh, just open that up to anybody's thoughts. I mean, I guess the one thing that I would say is that, again, when we think about, you know, moving beyond kind of um, the role of money, but think about, you know, an awesome framework with like concentrated interest versus dispersed interest and those simple framework, they always lead us, even putting the money aside, um, kind of believing that corporations are going to have more power than consumers or individuals just because they are, you know, they're organized. So, uh, you know, kind of social media has the potential of really changing this balance. Right? At the core, you think that this could be a tool for this person's interest to really become more organized and, and exert, you know, exert more effort. So 
despite all the qualms I have with social media right now and fake news and the lack of, you know, the lack of control on what's happening on these platforms, uh, maybe we are, you know, kind of really focused right now on the darker side of what social media, you know, is, and there is really a potential for social media ultimately to kind of make our politics more balanced. It's clearly not there right now, but I, I still hold on to this hope because of, you know, the ease of organizing, as you said, Neil. Let me just, just add about social media and companies. Social media now can pose a real threat for companies in terms of criticism going viral. This is something that has come up. We've been working with the George Washington University School of Political Management and one of the, uh, the professors there has looked at this. And uh, I think that you know, companies have to pay you know, attention to the type of criticism that, come, that, can, that can be coming from their political spending. I mean, I think there's a great example of public supermarkets in Florida. Public supermarkets in 2018 contributed to a gubernatorial candidate in the Republican primary who called himself a proud NRA sellout. And the criticism of public supermarkets went viral. It, you know, it led to the Parkland students having a die-in at the uh, company. Uh, and you know, for this election, the 2020 election, public supermarkets significantly changed its approach to political spending. You know, I saw some articles in the in the Florida papers on that, significantly reducing the amount of money, you know, being much more careful about, about their spending. So social media can be a double-edged sword. You know, it, it can work against, but in this case, it also can, uh, can we say, you know, introduce a note of a significant caution in behavior. Can I just add something to that, Joan? Um, when we think about these models based on reputation, you know, the fear of like your consumers giving you and boycotts, for all of these forces to work, well, first you have, need to have people that are not too, you know, too price sensitive. But I think more importantly, you need to have another option. Like right? you're going to vote with your feet and say, "I'm going to stop buying from this company because I don't like their political spending or I don't like what they say." There need to be an alternative. And this is, I think, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that, you know, kind of it, it's this kind of evolution. More kind of kind of economic power gives more political power and gives even more economic, even more economic power on top of this political power. But right? we need alternatives in the marketplace for these reputation mechanisms to actually be able to operate. And I think the conversation we have right now about the influence of cooperation on politics should go hand in hand with what's happening in terms of economic concentration. I think these two things are really related to one another and they reinforce each other um, in, in, in ways I think that, that should be kind of more central to a lot of these conversations. I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be my somewhat pessimistic rejoinder, Marianne, to your optimistic vision of, of social media as a platform for organizing, given the degree to which these companies are so concentrated and so powerful as single actors. You know, they set the rules for the, the terms of discussion that can happen on those platforms, and they can make the information that organizers are providing about, say, pr uh, a protest or a strike that they're, that they're planning available to, say, you know, repressive authoritarian regimes, as we've seen with Facebook in certain contexts or to employers who are seeking to track their employees. So there's certainly promise, but I do worry about the degree to which these companies are setting the policies and the terms of debate. So the next question I found to be interesting, especially someone who, who teaches ethics in a, in a business school. So this question is, there's been much discussion of corporate behaviors that damage social welfare, but corporations are not making these decisions, including the decisions to participate in, in politics. These are individual executives and board members. So what are the ethical standards supported by graduate business schools? Is ethical business behavior part of the academic culture of these institutions? Should there be a code of conduct for business school alumni similar to the code of conduct for lawyers adopted by the American Bar Association? I guess a broader issue is that, you know, uh, things like law and medicine are gilded and, and guilds have kind of ethical standards to their core. Um, there's some weird, there's some like some areas of business like CPAs or securities dealers, which have some form of gilding, but you know, to, to basically be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, you have to be going to these professional schools is another problem, but you don't need an MBA to practice business. Um, so yeah, any reaction to that question, particularly Marianne, you know, you teach in the business. No, I mean, that's what I'm just, just like you, I, I, I don't teach ethics in the business school, but I do try to, you know, do a little bit of ethics in, you know, in my class, that's really focused on the relationship between, uh, between firm and, and the non, the non market environment, including kind of relationship with government and, and, and money and lobbying and all of that. Um, and I've been, you know, teaching at this business school for 20 plus years, and I think things are changing. And I believe that the content of our curriculum is evolving, like I'm sure it is for you guys 
um, at Stanford, and there's more kind of more ethics and more of a desire, I think, among our students to, you know, kind of uh, have those conversations and think through those framework as to whether, you know, kind of there should be a notice of honor or some kind of certification. I have, I have no idea that's beyond my pay grade, but I do believe that it is, it is our responsibility as educators of business students to, you know, to have those, you know, to have those conversations and, and think about those issues and, and really make them top of mind for, you know, for our students. Um, won't say much more. You know, in, in my view, I, it feels that we need to reach a new equilibrium where you don't just have, for instance, these eth uh, new changes in, in ethical teachings or codes of conduct, but you have other institutions and organizations that are reinforcing the norm of following those ethics and those particular ways of structuring your business. And you know, if you look back at, you know, mid-century when, um, um, you know, many political observers argued that companies both had perhaps less political power relative to other interests and also had, particularly when we think about large national corporations, had a set of preferences and political involvements that were perhaps more forward looking and more grounded in a broader set of stakeholders, accepting, for instance, a mixed economy, accepting, for instance, the, the labor movement. And it felt like there, there were a whole range of factors that were pushing towards that direction. Certainly the cultural norm among business leaders, but also a norm of service coming out of the war, you know, labor unions that were keeping management accountable at the bargaining table, a strong regulatory state, all of these other pillars that were pushing in that direction. So I, I would think about not just about how to reestablish or, or form these, these codes of conduct, but rebuilding those other pillars that would push in that direction. You know, I think that, you know, uh, when you take a look at the decline of countervailing power that Galbraith had talked about, you know, that poses a real threat today. And, you know, Mark Mizruki in his book, The Fracturing of the American Corporate Elite, dealt with this. You know, again, getting into the 70s, the great inflation, you know, the beginning of basically the, 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 the uh, precursor of the business roundtable, you know, the CEOs who came together to basically break the construction unions dealing with, uh, with the uh, inflation and construction prices. But we paid an absolutely terrible price today, uh, you know, with, with, again, getting back to the distortions that we've had where, where you really have much more power in the corporate sector where labor, labor really is, is fighting just basically to stay alive. I could see that on Capitol Hill. Uh, you know, I could see, I see it in the work that I do today where, you know, you, you know unions really are, are shrinking and, uh, you know, they'll use the power of the proxy, but it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a last resort on their part. Uh, you know, it, it does pose a real challenge. You know, we came out with the model code to try to create a framework you know, that companies would follow as they approached, you know, through using corporate governance and, uh, and risk management, you know, uh, getting control of their spending and, and, you know, exercising greater judgment on that. But there are much broader issues that, that we are talking about that I think are absolutely uh, essential. Excellent. So we have kind of, I think, time for one more general question from the audience before we move into the, the panelist portion. So uh, this question is following the work of Luigi Zingales, maybe we need more democratic control of corporations by their owners and managerial attention to shareholder utility. Do you think that reform change in a different direction could be beneficial, making it easier for and building norms for individual investors to vote their preferences on shareholder resolutions, including those demanding transparency in corporate political activity, accounting for climate risk, addressing diversity and inclusion, so I think kind of this is a broader question on how corporate governance generally can solve this problem. Um, and Ken Schatz actually I think didn't get to ask the question previously, but it was actually a very interesting question. He had said the dovetails of this one, which is that um, shareholders have very heterogeneous preferences about the role of corporations in society. Um, and you already see examples, for example, of pension funds um, basically saying, you know, we wanna have more power and control uh, over what is an ethical thing for a company to do and how should they intervene in politics. And this also ties to the points about Bruce kind of having transfer, trans, um, transparency for the shareholders themselves. Um, so how can corporate governance be reformed or modified to address some of these problems? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned, you know, kind of already before, kind of, you know, kind of more German type system with more worker representation on the board. And I feel quite strongly that that would be, uh, you know, kind of, a reform going in the right in the right direction that doesn't seem totally you know kind of infeasible. Uh, respect to Luigi's work with with Oliver Hart, I mean, I, I very much agree that 
easing the mechanisms by which shareholders can, you know, can exert their voice and make their preferences known, uh, especially if those preferences differ from like, you know, what is uh, in the short term uh, financial interest of the corporation, you know, kind of is, is a great thing. So making sure that the voice of the shareholders can be heard. Uh, and I think Luigi and, and Oliver has kind of have done a good job really demonstrating that, you know, exit strategies, which many people talk about, are really not the right way to, you know, to get, uh, to get the right outcome. Uh, so all that, you know, all that is, um, is, very, um, is, is, is very true. Um, I, I think what, what remains, you know, kind of the, the, the counterpoint to that is, uh, you know, I was talking about economic concentration, you know, somebody mentioned in the earlier session, kind of institutional investors. Uh, I'm also very much worried that, you know, kind of with more, more voice for the shareholders, we're only going to hear from, you know, kind of BlackRock's preferences. And then we are really talking about extreme concentration of, um, of preferences in terms of uh, what's happening in our economy. So uh, shareholders are also themselves quite, you know, quite, quite concentrated. So one need, one need to keep that in mind. You know, let, let me just add on this, you know, we've used the shareholder resolution to make political disclosure on accountability an issue that companies have to address. And the shareholder resolution really has been very successful for us. And when we started in 2004, the first uh, uh, year that resolutions were filed, the average vote was 9%. In the last proxy season, the average vote on the CPA model resolution was 41.9%. Now, Marianne is absolutely right about the whole problem that you have with Black Rocks. You know, again, the, the concentration of, of, uh, of ownership and a, and a proxy power. But even with Black Rock, Fidelity, and Vanguard voting against the CPA resolution, we're still getting 41.9%. The lowest vote was 30%. And you know, we had four that were, were majority votes. So I think that the power of the proxy is still very, very important. I mean, the SEC uh, the rules changes that try to, you know, that to uh, you know, make it much more difficult to file and refile resolutions. Those need to be rescinded. The same thing with the attack on the proxy advisory services. You know, that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, because the, the, the shareholder resolution, give, you know, given, given the dysfunction of Congress and the fact that, that the legislative process at the national level can, it, is much more difficult to use to bring these issues to the attention of companies, the shareholder resolution has been very important, whether it's on political disclosure, on climate change, on diversity, on, you know, on say on pay. I mean, I've had friends you know, with companies say to me, that the shareholder resolution has brought these issues to their attention and that the company has then dealt with them. So I think the power of the proxy must be maintained and, and expanded. It is not abused. And you have to both let both the large shareholder, but also the small shareholder file that resolution. Now also, you're gonna to have to deal with the, the, uh, the issue of, of BlackRock, Fidelity and Vanguard and the fact that they are so obstinate, obstinate in, in their refusal to, to vote. I mean, basically, you know, they, they're, they're very, they're captives of the, of the companies that they own and of the management of the companies that they own. This is something that, you know, that we have been dealing with and uh, it's, it, you know, it's a great concern to us, but tremendous progress has been made notwithstanding their, their, uh, their opposition. Excellent. Yeah, all terrific points. And the only thing I would add is that the the yeah, rise yeah, of yeah. Um, uh, of managers ability to have this degree of control um, against shareholder interests potentially and diluting the access that folks have for governance decisions is itself a product of intense corporate lobbying. You look at an organization like the Business Roundtable, and this is a key issue for them, you know, making it harder for shareholders to have this kind of oversight and accountability of, of managers. So um, I think, yeah, it's a great case study in and of itself of the problem. It's the, it's the BRT and the chamber. So, yeah, I think that's also very interesting given the Business Roundtable's recent statement on corporate social responsibility in contrast to some of the stuff that Alex was talking about. They have to, they, they have to bring their actions in line with their rhetoric. Excellent. So I'm um, now going to move to the section um, where we have the panelists. Um, so when I call on you, um, please uh, turn on your camera and mic to join. So first, uh, Kartik Ramana, uh, your question about 
generally kind of the academic focus on causation and corporate political spending and how it might maybe has done a disservice to the field and to society potentially. So Kartik, if you can go ahead. I guess I was just trying to understand um, whether we've sort of uh, over invested in navel gazing as, as a quantitative social scientist by focusing on issues associated with causality and identification strategies when it comes to money and politics. Is there really a serious substantive disagreement that this money is having some sort of causal impact on political decision making? And if there is, what is that disagreement? And if not, how do we get the academics to focus on the right thing? I guess it depends which campus you sit on. <laughs> on my campus, sure there is. I mean, you know, it, it's been it's been really hard. So I'm, you know, I do I try to do that kind of work, and you know, kind of I've been in endless seminars presenting and being told yes, you know, but you're not showing me that you changed any kind of decision or any kind of outcome. You're not showing me that it gets us any further away from like, you know, kind of social welfare. And in practice, it's been extremely complicating, right? And if you look at all, I mean, Alex can talk about this way better than I can, but like all the book of science literature trying to find evidence that, you know, kind of money changes, you know, votes in Congress and look at the meta-analysis of, of people that have done that. It is, you know, it is far from, you know, far from overwhelming. There's a few fantastic case studies, the work that some of my colleagues have done on, on Dodd-Frank and the bailout of the, the, the bailout of the banks. But the evidence is, 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 is hard. It's hard to get a really, really good causal design. And when people have tried to look at, you know, kind of votes and how they're being influenced by the money, it's not been super convincing. I think one of the issues is that we observe such a small part, again, of the iceberg. When it comes to like studying lawmaking, we only observe things when they end up on the floor of the House and the Senate and votes actually happen. And I think our belief is that a lot of these process of influence is happening, you know, upstairs from the, right, the committee level, the subcommittee level, kind of like, all of the things that really as researchers we cannot uh, we cannot study as to whether it has done a disservice to you know the world in the conversation i mean i think if you point at the evidence we have about how much trust there is left in you know in, in institution the reputations of corporations my sense is that people look at the money and are worried that the system is totally corrupt even if us as academics may not have convinced our you know our most skeptical colleagues that you know this is actually changing decisions but you know, I think the political scientists probably have a much better way to answer this question. Alex, I, I agree with everything that you said. That I think that a, a big issue with a quantitative analysis of money and politics is that you only observe such a small sliver that's easily quantifiable, and we think that so much else matters. But in addition, and and I think in response to that, I might say. If we look to a broader form of evidence, um, you know, interviews with these key players, uh, archival material, organizational records, I think we can pin down, you know, if not smoking guns, pieces of evidence that allow us to make um, qualified causal claims. Um, and sometimes that'll be in a quantitative environment and sometimes it won't be. And I'll just give an example from, from my own work and thinking about the influence of a group like the American Legislative Exchange Council on state lawmakers. You know, certainly I can show that, for instance, these under-resourced lawmakers are more likely to draw from ALEC if they are junior, if they don't have the staffers, if they're in these states with low legislative capacity. I can try to, in you know, a quantitative framework, net out the effect of their ideology of the state's political Political environment, but you know, is that a is that a you know precise causal estimate? No. Um, so I think we need to buttress it with other forms of evidence. Interviews with these people. How is it that you came to rely on this organization? Why is it that you came to rely on this organization? Why do you um, recommend it to other people? You know, hearing first person accounts from the key players who were involved in these processes, and then checking that against, for instance, internal records from the organization that has discussions of how they've thought about this as a method of influence. I mean, all of these things can triangulate and point to um, the sort of conclusions that I think can help us under, better understand the influence of money in politics. You know, let me, let me just say as a non-academic, when I deal with some political scientists, not Alex, but, uh, but others, you know, I brought to their attention other areas of the political spending that they should be looking at, other groups. You know, there was, you know, one eminent political scientist who focused on the U.S. chamber and on the Republican Governors Association. And I said, you have to look much more broadly. And you know, and then when we, we did a corporate political accountability roundtable at the Stern School, we've been having them every two years for the past several years. I could see that, uh, that, that my suggestion had an impact because one of his colleagues began to talk about 
other organizations that they began looking at. You know, that's why when I talk about the range of 527s, you know, the governor's associations, the state legislative campaign committees and the attorney general associations, this is another whole area that needs to be looked at. And then when you take a look at the Center for Political Accountability's uh, our track your company database, you know, you're beginning to see there the trade association payments. You know, we ask companies to archive their, their uh, expenditures for the past, for, for at least five years going back. We're now doing research on that. We're beginning to see in the archived uh, um, spending uh, reports that they're filing trends in terms of companies reducing their non-deductible payments to trade associations. So it, it's a matter of taking a look at what additional information, is, or, you know, uh, what figures are out there. And then, you know, working with some sort of serious advocacy groups who are collecting this type of data or digging into this. Thanks everyone. Thanks Karthik for your great question. Um, I'd next like to recognize Anat Admati who has the next uh, question from the, the panel. Hi, and thank you. Uh, so Bruce was talking about, was talking about uh, requiring the SEC requiring disclosures. And my question is what happens to private corporations? So corporations often say, uh, oh, there's too many disclosure requirements. I'm just gonna go private until half the economy is privatized and not under SEC disclosure rules, unless it's somebody else who gives disclosure rules. We have opaque shell corporations that have virtually no disclosure rules. So I wonder you know, how else we can get it. And, and relatedly, what is the limit of disclosure, of course, which goes to Alex's, you know, and other people saying we're going to need to do more rebalancing than just disclose, because even with political contributions, you know, disclosures haven't really helped us from individuals as well. Uh, that was not enough to, to, to say and we have a lot of dark money as well. You know, I think, and that, that's a very, very good question about private companies. I mean, I've, I've spoken with people like Ira Milstein about that and Rob Jackson. And they have, both of them have said to me that, you know, in making it the norm, making it the norm, that, you know, there will be the spillover, it will, you know, it will be then required of all companies, you know, if you establish it with, with, with publicly held companies, and you have the wide buy in, which, which we are seeing, then, then you will have that, uh, that spillover effect. Uh, and, and so, you know, we recognize that, that there are limits. But the fact is, you know, we're taking a look at, at how do we expand it as, you know, as we establish it as, as the, the standard. You know, and again, when you asked about disclosure, it's disclosure and accountability, because you're absolutely right. Disclosure in and of itself doesn't change behavior. So they, you disclose it and you go on your merry way. But the fact is, I mean, look, at, we did an article for the Harvard Business Review five years ago a board member's guide to corporate political spending. And we did that. So we laid out for directors, what do they need to know about the rules and regulations and laws governing political spending? How do they conduct their assessment of the company's spending? What questions do they ask? What policies that should, should they be adopting? I mean, those are, are essential. And, and the fact is you know, that, that, that the pressure has to be put on the board to seriously address it and then to ensure adherence with it. I don't use the word compliance because compliance really is limited, but adherence. And so it really goes much, much further in terms of really bringing about these, these type of changes. And it means pressures, pressure from the outside, whether it's from consumers or from the investors uh, or from the general public. You know, If at some point we get a legislature that can become functioning then these issues you know, should be addressed in Congress. They should be addressed through legislation and through appointments to the regulatory agencies. I mean, that's gonna be a critical factor in the, in the Biden administration, because I'll tell you on the Obama administration, I think that the regulatory appointments were either mediocre to bad. I'll just add a quick empirical point to um, the question about privately held companies, which is that it tends to often be the case that these privately held companies are uh, have managers who themselves are 
uh, disproportionately likely to be involved in more ideological political activities. Yeah. I've looked closely at the, for instance, the Koch donor seminars that have been meeting over the past several years and collect donations from now 400 to 600 very wealthy millionaires and billionaires. And the proportion of managers and, and owners at privately held companies in those seminars is much higher than in the overall population of, say, the, uh, the Forbes list of, of wealthiest individuals. And I think that's no coincidence to the extent that often these people are preferring the uh, to hide the activities that are happening inside of the company as well as their political activities. And you know, perhaps the best example of this is, of, co of, of course, Coke Industries with uh, uh, Charles and the late David Koch um, pioneering these political seminars and, and uh, ideological political activity. So I actually have a follow-up question to Alex on that. Um, as, as possibly uh, uh, something that's been hypothesized as a source. So uh, Eitan Hirsch, who's a prominent political scientist, has sort of this theory of political hobbyism to explain some of this corporate imbalance, which is that a lot of the people that want to um, actually decrease corporate power, they view politics as a hobby and actually don't do any of the hard work. So they like kind of tweeting about politics and things like that. Whereas the Koch brothers, they actually um, know how to do politics. They do it at the ground level, they train people. Whereas, you know, the Bloombergs and the Tom Sires of the world, this is like a fun thing for them. They don't actually take it seriously. So I don't know, Alex, what you think about this political hobbyism uh, explanation for some of this imbalance power. I think yeah, you're you know, I do right. think it's an important explanation um, of uh, of why the Koch network and conservative wealthy donors have been so successful, especially when you think about the state level. You know, for many decades, it was the case that leading progressive donors and leaders didn't pay a lot of attention to the states. Now, there are certainly organizations that were involved and participating in state races and state legislation. Uh, especially public sector labor unions, um, as well as some environmental groups, reproductive right groups. But on the whole, you just didn't see significant investments from leading progressive donors. They were investing far more in uh, legal strategies, as well as what was happening in Washington, D.C. I think that's in part a cultural, um, uh, 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 there's a cultural dr driver to that, that um, in Washington, D.C. was seen as being more exciting, the place where change actually happened. There was a practical element to it, too. You know, for many years, I think a lot of progressives, including progressive donors, you know, thought about the states as being relatively limited in the sort of public policy that they could do. But whatever the sources, it created this major imbalance where over decades, the Koch political network was able to establish a federated political advocacy network of organizations that were pushing for conservative Republicans to be elected to state legislatures, to governorships, and then pushing exactly those elected officials to pass right-leaning policy on a whole range of issues. They, the left really ceded the terrain when it came to the states. And this has had very significant consequences when you layer on top of that uh, control of the redistricting process, as Bruce alluded to earlier, um, you know, the gains that Republicans made in the states after 2010 and now after 2020 um, will afford them the opportunity to draw a number of districts about, you know, last count about five times as many as, as Democrats. And it's also allowed them to pass policies that, you know, shift the terrain. You know, when you attack labor unions, for instance, at the state level, you make it a lot harder for Democrats to get elected. So for all those reasons, I, I agree with um, the uh, Eitan's hypothesis that, um, you know, I think in many ways it was or, uh, conservative donors that were much more focused on organization building, particularly at the state level. You know, and let me just reiterate, you know, what, what Alex said, when you take a look at what the Republican State Leadership Committee did in 2010, Ed Gillespie comes in as the, becomes the, the head of the RSLC, and his focus on raising corporate money. I mean, there was a significant increase in money from the 2008 cycle to the 2010 cycle, and they were, they were really targeted in their, in their spending and in, in the legislatures that they wanted to flip. And Alex is absolutely right in terms of all that has flowed from that. The attack on LGBTQ rights, the attack on women's reproductive rights. Then you take a look at, you know, at, at the environment and the whole issue of racial justice now, the problems that you have because of the, the gerrymandering in these legislatures. What type of legislation, what type of programs are not passed are not, or not adopted? I mean, that, you know, all of the, and then, in 2020, I mean, what we what happened, what did happen in this election? That's something that's very important to look at. Excellent. Our next panelist question, uh, Ken Schatz. So, uh, Ken, if you want to turn your um, camera on and ask the question. 
Everyone, so thanks for a great panel. So the question that I have is, you guys are advocating a lot of reforms that are about fixing institutions. Um, but the problem is that institutional design decisions are much lower profile than policy decisions, right? So the things that are going to get most regular people organized and active, it's nothing to do with this institutional design stuff. I mean, just being blunt. Um, so, and I would think that that would mean that the power imbalances that you're concerned about and that many people participating here are concerned about are going to be much more pronounced on the institutional level than on the policy level. Um, so is there reason to expect that the sort of institutional reforms you're advocating are actually feasible or what does it take to make them become feasible? I guess I would offer a hypothesis. I think it's exactly right that the sort of institutional reforms like creating an office of public participation in a particular federal agency or state agency that would support uh, nonprofit organizations to check the power of companies in the regulatory process. You know, it's hard to put all of that on a banner and say this will help build countervailing, countervailing power um, and perhaps hard to, to mobilize people in elections. But I think the secret is to, you know, politicians can run on a variety of issues and then when they're in office, choose where to direct their attention. And so maybe this won't be the banner issue that gets people to the polls. Um, but I think to the extent that politicians understand the, the the logic behind the creation of these proposals, they should be pursuing them. Um, that's certainly, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at conservative strategies in the states. And that's certainly been a strategy that conservative elected officials have pursued. You know, they didn't run on redistricting or gerrymandering when they were in the 2010 cycle, they ran on issues that were popular in their states and um, resonated with their voters. But then when in office, this was one of their first priorities. The only thing I would add is that everything that's got to do with worker rights, I think, can you know certainly mobilize mobilize people. So that angle to like you know corporate governance reform sounds like something that you know could uh, mobilize enough people. Terrific. Um, our, I think Kartik has an additional question on comparative political economy. Uh, Kartik? I guess I was trying to understand if there was a liberal democracy that the panelists would uh, hold out as an exemplar uh, that has got the corporate money and politics equation, I suppose, roughly right, or if not roughly right, certainly uh, better than the United States. I don't have an exemplar, but I'll, I'm just going to provide an anecdote. Uh, I think about a month ago, I was at the NBR political economy conference and uh, the organizers had the good idea of bringing um, three academics that were now um, serving in, um, in, as legislators um, in you know, kind of other countries in the US. And one of them was, uh, was in Europe. And he kind of gave us a primer of like kind of what he has learned kind of being a lawmaker in the EU over, uh, over that time. And at no point did he bring um, the topic of interest groups. And I was just striking to me. And I reminded him of that. He didn't bring interest groups. And he said, no, they don't really, you know, they don't really matter. They don't really play a role. And that was, I think, really, really striking because I felt like if I had had this conversation with somebody in the US, I would have thought that would have been a central component of what, you know, kind of uh, what you'd observe. So that's just a little anecdote. Yeah, I think I would point to other other rich democracies that, in addition to having much tighter campaign finance restrictions, have a healthier ecosystem in their political economies of, for instance, labor unions that have a seat at the table at the corporate level, have a seat at the table in the government through tripartite negotiations over a range of economic policies, um, and have elected officials that are more likely to be representative of the people that that, um, uh, that are electing them. So, you know, I, I think the campaign finance regime is an important variable, but we have to to think about those other variables too that all contribute to more egalitarian political and economic outcomes. Bruce, did you have a last comment on that or? No, I mean, look at the, you know, we, we've been asked why, why doesn't the Center for Political Accountability also look at other countries? And the United States is so unique, you know, in again, having a decentralized system, so many places where money can be given, so many you know, ways in which can be given directly to candidates, to various organizations, you know, that, that, are, that disclose or that don't disclose. And, uh, uh, you know, it, and, and very different tr traditions. I mean, th that's why even when you take a look at the Global Reporting Initiative, at one point we were taking a look at, you know, should we try to, to incorporate, you know, some of you know, the reporting requirements that would apply more to the United States. And we found that it was too difficult. We were really sui generis, just very unique. Uh, you know, it, 
it is different here, significantly different, culturally and politically, socially. So uh, last question I'll ask for the panel actually comes from the q and I forgot who, who um, asked it, so sorry if I didn't attribute it, but uh, it, it noted that many of the issues that we're talking about, if you look at the public opinion data, public opinion is on the side of trying to reduce the role of corporate money in politics, yes. whether it's various policy reforms, um, even the Citizens United decision when they polled about it, it was a very unpopular decision among the public. So I guess the question I would ask is, given that public opinion is on the side of this, what are the main obstacles? And you could think of many. So for example, it could be uh, various things like political institutions that lead to gridlock. It could be that some of the parties that should be potentially supporting this, like the uh, Democratic Party doesn't resonate with people on social issues. Um, or it could be that that party has been captured by corporate money as well. Um, so just kind of like, you know, we would think of like a, an Occam's razor question would be like, if people want this, why do we not have it? If it if, why is it so hard? Exactly because of what we've been talking about for the last hour and a half, I think, right? There are tons of topics and areas where public opinion is in one direction and business is in the other one. And, you know, even if there's more public support for the reform, they don't happen exactly for the reasons that we talked about, that we talked about before. Money, organization, concentration you know, kind of all of those things matter to, to get the outcome that you want on top of all the gridlock issues that, you know, Alex and Bruce talked about before. Yeah, I think that, you know, when, when you take a look at, uh, at a fixing responsibility, you have to go into a con you have to go into, into the party system. You take a look at the Republicans, you know, after the passage of McCain-Feingold in 2002, Mitch McConnell made it very clear no more campaign finance legislation was going to be passed. You know, you know, he was for disclosure before he was against disclosure. So the real obstacle, you know, in terms of dealing with this legislatively is the Republican Party and uh, and then and McConnell. But also, you know, you have to go back and take a look at, at the rise of Newt Gingrich and how Gingrich and the transformation of the Republican Party under Gingrich that really then became sort of you have sort of the lineal descent into Donald Trump you know, has really, you know, grossly distorted our, our, our system. But, uh, but, you know, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, with, with the Republicans at this point viewing disclosure as, you know, as creating real problems for them in terms of raising the money that, uh, that they're looking to raise, uh, you know, it, 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 this has really been a tremendous obstacle to addressing, uh, to addressing this issue. Okay, uh, so we're about at time. So thank you so much to our panelists for um, all your terrific insights. Um, I think uh, talking to a knots thing at the beginning, I definitely think this is a great example of a panel where we can take the barriers down between disciplines and even like in academia, outside academia, and, and really kind of see where all these things both uh, talk to each other and ways to expand all the individual um, disciplines as well. Um, so thanks uh, to both the audience out there for all your terrific questions, as well as the panelists. Um, and I think we're going to turn it over to um, Anat, who's going to wrap us up for the day. Thank you. Thank you. This was a great panel and a great day. Uh, you notice that a, a couple of things I want to mention here. One is that we had the panel just of law of legal academics and the next one had no legal academics. In the next two days, we're going to have panels that have both uh, legal scholars and others uh, mixed up together. Uh, also, I want to say that uh, Susanna Kim Repkin uh, was uh, generous in her introductions, but even in the second panel as well, we had uh, books worth reading, such as Alex's book called State Capture, which I just read and learned a lot. And what I want to say with that is that we all have a lot to learn on these issues. And what came up particularly, I didn't want to stay on to not take on too much, but is really that the academics are often looking under the lights and they're not really like thinking about what needs to be really addressed. That is really where the problems are rather than where data are, et cetera. So uh, I think with that, it's really uh, been a great start to begin to have more conversations and 
figure out what it is that we academics, other people can do. So I thank all, everybody who participated today and we're gonna to continue tomorrow with the discussion of not just money in politics, but sort of policy expertise uh, as it potentially distorts policy issues uh, and therefore democracy. And then go to the media, which is obviously already came up a little bit and how the public even knows what's going on at all beyond the disclosures that nobody might look at what they open up their newspaper or their social media. Mm -hmm.